retain products of conception. And I'm really glad that I get to give this talk because this is something that drives a lot of people crazy, not just radiologists, but the gynecologists and obstetricians as well. And so I get to do how I do it, which might not be how you and your group have decided to do it, but I hope I'm gonna leave you with a few pearls that you can go back to discuss with your referring clinicians. So I have no disclosures pertinent to this presentation. And what I'm going to hopefully answer today is um, how we assess why there might be pain or bleeding postpartum, a discussion of how you should deal with the obstetrician who says, well, I was in there during that C-section. There's no way there's still placenta. Um, if there's lots of flow, how to figure out if it's an RPOC or AVM, and hopefully I'll convince you to get rid of that term AVM when you're dealing postpartum. And then um, the myometrium's thin in a patient with retained products. How do you tell if it's an accreta or how do you assess if it's an invasive mole? So frequently we start out with a transabdominal scan. Um, now if patients have had C-section, they might have a big uh, dressing on their abdomen. And since you're going to probably go to transvaginal anyway, there's no reason to remove that dressing. Um, but we do take images transabdominally just to make sure we're not missing anything large. And you can frequently see heterogeneous contents within the endometrial cavity. And so the question is, is this blood products or is it retained products? And when you do a vaginal scan, this is a retroflexed uterus, you can see there's heterogeneous material here. We turn on color and you can actually see some of the flow going into this placental tissue. And then clearly it's placental tissue, you're going to measure it. And the measurement it turns out is very important because at least in my institution, if it's less than four centimeters, they might try and do medical therapy, try and make the blood vessels decrease, and hopefully the patient will pass it on her own. Um, and if it's four centimeters or greater, they're definitely going to go in and do a DNC. So we look for a mass in the endometrial cavity. If there's flow, we know it's retained products. If there's no flow, um, then it could be devascularized retained products or blood clot. But when you see something that looks like placenta, it has placental type calcifications, you can say that it's retain products. What about when there's something small like this? Well, if you look at the endometrial echo in the mid-uterine cavity, um, and it is within the endometrium itself, uh, that must be retained products. That's not blood clot. Blood clot is going to distend the endometrial cavity. It won't be just on one side like this. So I know, well, maybe she had a polyp before she got pregnant, but since she's recently been pregnant, it's likely retained products. And here's another patient with a small area with a small bit of blood flow here. And even though it's just a small area here, I can be very, very confident that it's most likely retained products. And the reason we want to be very careful about that is that if they decide to go in and do a DNC, you could end up with a complication like this, where they've actually ruptured her uterus. And so frequently, um, they'll go in and they'll do this blind DNC and they'll scrape really hard and, and frequently um, they'll end up doing this. And so we don't want them to do a DNC procedure when it's just a small area of uh, blood products. So size does matter. And if you have this tiny bit of blood flow here, and you don't really see much at all. Um, you can just measure this area with abnormal blood flow within the endometrium. And most likely, this is a patient who's going to do very well with tincture of time, with or without some kind of medical therapy. So small areas of retained products can be treated with uh, medications. Usually, at my institution, they, they use misoprostol. Uh, larger areas like this, we're going to measure in three dimensions. And again, that measurement will help them decide um, how to go after that material. The other thing you want to do is look at the endometrial myometrial interface because you expect placenta to extend beyond the endometrial cavity a little bit. Um, and here we can see this is some calcified material within the endometrial cavity extending into the myometrium. But the further it extends into the myometrium, the more likely it is that you're going to suggest that there's placenta accreta. And here you can see the myometrium is very, very thin. And uh, this would not be a normal placenta. This is an invasive placenta. Whether it's an accreta or an increta, we don't really care. But this is a patient who probably will not do well with a DNC because if they try and scrape this and get the whole thing out, you know they're going to rupture the uterus. There's no way they can get this otherwise. So causes of postpartum bleeding. When a patient comes in and uh, bleeding postpartum, it really matters how long ago was the delivery. Um, because you might have fluid and debris as a normal finding uh, postpartum. In the first 24 hours, uterine atony can be a cause of bleeding. I'm going to discuss more the subinvolution of the placental site, um, but it's an important thing to keep in your mind as a cause of bleeding. Endometritis, usually the patient will have uh, pain and discharge, maybe have a fever, and then retain products.
So retained products is abnormal. You'll, uh, the patients will typically present with abnormal bleeding postpartum pain, and they may or may not have a fever. And part of the problem with retained products is that it can coexist with endometritis, and that's why the fever might be present. So it occurs, retained products, when there's placental or trophoblastic tissue in the uterus after delivery or miscarriage. It's actually most frequently after a first or second trimester delivery or termination of the pregnancy. And if you think about that, it's because normally um, the uterus is made uh, to deliver the placenta after delivery in the third trimester. But in the second trimester, the placenta is still very invasive at that point in time, and it hasn't let go yet. And that's why you'll frequently end up with retained products. After a term delivery, it makes sense that retained products would be more common after a vaginal delivery than after a cesarean, but of course you can get retained products after a C-section. So here's a study um, looking at 176 women with sonographic findings of retained products, and when they looked at the history, 54% uh, had had spontaneous abortions, 20% vaginal delivery, 18% elective terminations, and 6% C-section. So you can see 6%, that's a pretty high number for C-sections. Um, retained products in a cesarean patient, in my experience, most likely these have an evidence of an invasive placenta. And so you should definitely think about that because, again, they've been in there. They've had the patient open. Why would some of the placental tissue still be there? Most likely because it's abnormally adherent. So, again, you're going to see this very thin myometrium around um, the area of placenta. So um, you definitely want to look for placenta accreta there, and there's no reason to do an MR. We can make that diagnosis just fine with ultrasound. What about first trimester retained products? You know, we think about that as an incomplete abortion, for example. Some people will use the term incomplete abortion. Some people will say retained products. Here's a study looking at 104 women who had a medical abortion at six to nine weeks. 55% had sonographic evidence of retained products at two weeks post-medical treatment, and most resolved without any further therapy. Um, so the symptoms weren't correlated with the sonographic findings. So basically, it takes a while for a first trimester miscarriage to resolve. And so using retained products in the first trimester situation is different than we use that term after a second or third trimester delivery. So term retained products, um, it's thought to occur in about 1% of term pregnancies, and the main risk factors are failure to progress during delivery, placenta accreta, and an instrument delivery. I also want to take a minute to talk about severe secondary postpartum hemorrhage. And so this is when a patient has already delivered and then she presents later with bleeding. So 24 hours to six weeks postpartum, um, delivery after 22 weeks, that's the definition. And in this particular study, um, they looked at a big cohort of women over a nine-year period, and they found the incidence of secondary postpartum hemorrhage of 0.23%, 60 out of 26,000 deliveries. Placental retention, so retained products, was the cause in 30% of those. This sub-involution of the placental bed, again, I'm going to get to that in a minute, happened in 13%, and endometritis in 10%. So keep this in mind when people come back with postpartum bleeding. So what is subinvolution of the placental site? Well, I mentioned that the adherence to the uterus is different in the second trimester than in the third trimester. And what the placenta needs to do is to invade the myometrium. That's how it gets the vascularity to the fetus. That's how it is able to deliver oxygen and other nutrients. So you see hypoechoic tortuous vessels along the inner third of the myometrium without any tissue in the endometrial cavity. And this is what a lot of people end up calling an AVM because they don't see a mass in the endometrial cavity. And yet an AVM, I'd like you to think of that as something that the patient has congenitally, all right? And this is something that's normal. It's physiologic, but it's persistent. So we just need to have another term for it so that people understand that it can resolve on its own. So pulsed wave Doppler sonography can show increased peak systolic velocity with a low velocity waveform, and the increased areas of vascularity correlate with placental implantation site documented pre-delivery. Moving on now to the management, we can do expectant management. That's where you might just give uterotonic agents, such as the mesoprostol that I mentioned before, or methyl ergonavine. They can do the surgical management with a DNC or vacuum aspiration. And some people are now more frequently using hysteroscopic removal because that can be associated with fewer adhesions post-intervention. And then we want to reserve interventional radiology with uterine artery embolization for those cases that are very, very hypervascular um, that we suspect have early draining veins or those who have severe bleeding.
So here's a study by um, Aya Kamaya in abdominal imaging uh, last year looking at uh, predictors of clinical management of retained products um, and looking at expectant versus medical versus surgical management. And they found that when they saw high flow and they just graded their flow qualitatively, um, that surgery was likely, and when they saw low or no flow, that expectant or medical management was more likely, and that's, this of course makes sense. So one of the questions that we ask when we see retained products, as I mentioned before, is how large is it? Three dimensions, quantifying size can affect management. Does it have flow? And if it has flow, would you call it hypervascular or not? And so one of the things that's not clear in the literature is whether you should perform peak systolic velocity, whether you should actually quantify the blood flow. And I would like to have an argument for saying yes. Now we can't necessarily angle correct, but we can still get a lot of information from looking at that waveform. So why might retained products be hypervascular and mimic an AVM? Well, again, it's because of the persistence of those vascular changes in the spiral arteries that are induced by the trophoplastic invasion during pregnancy. And then you get shunting from the development of AV fistulas within the placenta that are caused by necrosis of the chorionic villi. And another problem that you can have is that prior DNC can actually lead to some of these AV communications in the myometrium. So here's a drawing um, from the NCBI website showing in early pregnancy the spiral arteries by the end of the first trimester showing how they might grow and by the third trimester how very, very large these are. And it makes sense that if you just lop off the placenta here that you might have some abnormal bleeding. And again, we need this for the placental circulation. So when should you mention subinvolution of the placental site? Well, if you see this abnormal vascularity in the myometrium, and you don't see a mass in the endometrial cavity. Um, and it's really important to mention this because this can be treated uh, medically. And what we need to know is that some abnormal flow, what we might think about as abnormal flow in the myometrium is actually a normal uh, postpartum finding. So in, in this series of 385 patients um, who had their first week, uh, six-week study um, after pregnancy, 8.3% had advanced enhanced vascularity by color Doppler. In another series of 93 patients, um, they saw 50% of patients had abnormal vascularity at day three, and that went down to 3% at six weeks postpartum. So again, very, very common to see a lot of vascularity in the myometrium. In this study, highly vascularized retained products, um, they found that if a peak systolic velocity was greater than 60, it was associated with blood loss and procedure-related complications. Um, but when they actually did the statistical correlation, they couldn't, they couldn't find that. And this is very problematic because this paper has been misquoted to say that highly vascularized retained products doesn't make a difference. Well, they started out with highly vascularized retained products, and then they looked at variations in that and didn't see a difference. Um, but if you look at all retained products, um, you're going to see more of a spectrum. So here is a patient. You can see great big vessel in the myometrium lots of blood flow, at least it looks like lots of blood flow. And if you don't look at a scale here, you might think that's a lot of blood flow, but then when you actually look at a scale, you've got a peak systolic velocity that's actually pretty low. This is somebody who's going to do well with the DNC. So just looking at the color qualitatively, I'm afraid doesn't work that well. Um, here's another patient, this looks very similar, great big vessel, and here we've got a peak systolic velocity that's very, very high, greater than 80. Um, in fact, uh, when we look at this particular patient, we've got a peak systolic velocity of 190, which is really huge, but it's only a small vessel here. Um, and so we're able to qualify that, and this was able to be removed hysteroscopically without a problem. So I've got one minute left to talk about placenta accreta, and I already mentioned the thin myometrium, that's when you're going to mention it. When do you suggest invasive trophoblastic disease or molar pregnancy? Basically, we're not very good at this, and so it's a patient who has a bizarre appearance to the retained products with a persistently elevated beta HCG. And you can see this looks very heterogeneous after a DNC with lots of abnormal blood flow. So invasive moles, of course, the most common type of persistent trophoblastic neoplasia, and um, we, we usually see this incidentally after a DNC. Another case. And one more case, very heterogeneous, very abnormal appearing, and very, very vascular. When do you need a CT or MR? Basically never. 
I'm not showing you any CT or MR. And I am showing you one angiography where we had high peak systolic velocity, and you can see this early draining vein. These are the patients that might benefit from um, embolization prior to treatment. So basically, in the first half of pregnancy, elevated risk for retained products, but it can also occur after term delivery and C-section. If it looks like placenta, it probably is placenta. Color Doppler flow increases the likelihood of retained products, but the absence of flow does not exclude this diagnosis. High peak systolic velocity is associated with bleeding at the time of DNC, so don't forget to assess with spectral Doppler. And please avoid the term AVM, but mention retained products with high peak systolic velocity that might benefit from uterine artery embolization. Thank you very much.